Hello, I'm Lily Hoyam. And I'm Gordon Johnson. Welcome to the Last Question Podcast, a production of DataFest, the ongoing series of data and artificial intelligence innovation events run by the Data Lab, Scotland's innovation centre for data and AI, hosted by the University of Edinburgh. We have another fascinating guest with us here today. Ken Liu is a futurist and an author of speculative fiction, a winner of the Nebula, Hugo and World Fantasy Awards. He wrote The Dandelion Dynasty, a silk punk epic fantasy series, starting with The Grace of Kings, as well as short story collections, The Paper Menagerie and Other Stories, and The Hidden Girl and Other Stories. The final book in the Dandelion Dynasty series is out now. You can find Speaking Bones in your favourite local bookshop. Lily, you and I are both big fans of the various punk aesthetics, the steampunk, cyberpunk, raypunk, dieselpunk and whatnot. What's your favourite? I think I'd say cyberpunk is my favourite at the moment. Um, High tech, low life? Yeah. Maybe because... Well, I've read quite a lot of cyberpunkish books. Punkish. <laughs> Maybe because I've read quite a lot of cyberpunk books. Um, and also maybe because it reflects my life in a way more. Because I think we do live in a high-tech, low-life society already. So we can 100%. see it reflecting our current problems and problems of people around us. Yeah, I mean, it's bizarre that we live in a world where, you know, we've got almost the entire knowledge of mankind condensed into a phone we can keep in our pockets, but people can't pay their energy bills. Mm. You know, it's um, we do live in quite a, a sort of low life, low quality of life society in a lot of ways. Yeah, because you'd expect with the high tech, things would be better. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because if you like fifty years ago, if you were to say we're going to launch a telescope that can see back almost to the dawn of time, you would kind of assume that society had moved on sufficiently so that everybody has their needs met by this point. Yeah. So maybe that's actually strange that I would say cyberpunk when I would want to use other punk types as escapism instead. Like maybe steampunk is quite nice because it's so kind of... (laughs) Whimsical. Whimsical, yeah. But then the human problems are all the same in these anyway. So whatever the... Whether it's steampunk or silkpunk, raypunk, all the human issues are still there. Mm -hmm. So maybe you never really truly do escape. Mm. It's just the the objects and mechanisms around you do change. Yeah, I mean, lots of people seem to aspire to the cyberpunk life and aesthetic, but it was never meant to be something that we were supposed to attain. Mm. You know, it was meant to be a warning. Oh, I do like the aesthetic, though. Maybe that's why I like it, too. The aesthetic's fantastic, yeah. (laughs) Neon lights, oh, you love it. Stick a neon light on anything, and I'm a happy man. So today we're going to be talking to Ken about silkpunk. And it might be useful to share Ken's definition of silkpunk from his website before we jump into the interview. Uh, Lily, shall we split this bit up? Um, He says of creating the aesthetic, quote, I was influenced by the ideas of W. Brian Arthur, who articulates a vision of technology as language. The task of the engineer is much like that of a poet in that the engineer must creatively combine existing components to solve novel problems, thereby devising artifacts that are new expressions in a technical language. In the silk punk world of my novels, this view of technology is dominant. The vocabulary of the technology language relies on materials of historical importance to the people of East Asia and the Pacific Islands. Bamboo, shells, coral, paper, silk, feathers, sinew, etc. The grammar of the language puts more emphasis on biomimetics. The airships regulate their lift by analogy with the swim bladders of fish, and the submarines move like whales through the water. The engineers are celebrated as great artists who transform the existing language and evolve it towards ever more beautiful forms. Let's go to Ken and find out more. In your definition of silk punk, uh, you mentioned biomimetics. Uh, the idea that technology emulates forms and processes found in nature uh, it brings to mind the Arthur C. Clarke quotes that everyone knows, you know, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic, uh, which we've since heard people elaborate on to say any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from nature. Uh, Do you see biomimetics as the future of technology? Should we be approaching our problems by looking to nature, which may have already discovered solutions through evolution? Yeah, that's a, that's a really um, great question. And uh, my answer is going to be kind of long. So just bear with me because I I think it's actually a really interesting discussion point. Um, so to begin with, I want to just give everyone uh, my particular twist on technology. Uh, it's not 
uh, it's not a new definition by any means, but I think it reframes the question a little bit. So the way I think about technology is a little bit different. Um, normally, when we talk about technology, we we mean things like computer chips and rocket engines and things of that sort. Um, and they are examples of technology, but but I think technology is actually quite a bit broader. Um, I think of technology as uh, you know related to its Greek roots uh, in the word. It's a discourse about skill, about craft. So anything that is uh, a manifestation, a a reification of mental patterns, um, the mind made tangible would be considered technology in my mind. So in the same way that beavers build dams and bees make honeycombs, humans make technology. So whether it's writing, whether it's computer chips, whether it's social custom, uh, that's all forms of technology. Um, so in other words, technology is not opposed to nature, but rather just derived from human nature. Technology is literally the manifestation of human nature in the same way the beaver dam is the manifestation of the nature of a beaver. So with that out of the way, um, one could argue that you know all human technology is merely a manifestation of our biology, a, a kind of biomimetics to begin with in the first place, um, which is you know true but also trivial. Uh, so it's not quite what I meant. Um, what I really have in mind is that um, for too long we have this idea that human technology is a, is opposed to nature, that we're supposed to uh, conquer it to. Um, uh, uh, tame nature in some way, but in, when in fact we're just sort of part of nature. The, the the more our technology fits into the natural patterns and the larger ecology around all of us, the better off we will be. So to give you a very concrete example, right? Uh, humans, like all animals, reshape the landscape around us uh, as a manifestation of our biology. Um, but the way we've been doing this lately has been deeply irrational and not really in accordance with our nature in some sense. So to give you a concrete example, um, to move a 150 pound human being from one house to the supermarket, which is about half a mile away, we actually move a 7,000 pound vehicle that distance. It it is very bizarre that we believe that is a correct use of technology or a good manifestation of our nature to go back and forth and move this giant seven and pound vehicle for the purpose of moving a human being 150 pounds that distance. Um, and we have built up an entire technology infrastructure to support this weird way of moving things. We build roads, we build parking lots, we you know, an alien visitor to uh, to the Earth would think that we worship cars, that, that cars are the most important items, objects in our cultural existence. We devote vastly more space to cars in the city than we're humans. Uh, we can we reshape our entire landscape for the purpose of cars. Um, and it doesn't even make sense because to move from place to place, we move so much more than our um, body weight. It's almost as if we think every trip is a space launch of some sort, where the payload is a tiny part of the trip. But it makes no sense. We're not defying gravity with these trips. Why do we need to do this? Um, and so the way, you know, even now when we're talking about electric vehicles, uh, I don't really think fundamentally we're changing anything. I mean, you buy a Tesla that's still a 7,000 pound vehicle and you're still moving it from place to place. Uh, you are shifting the energy cost from one place to another, but you're not fundamentally altering anything. So I don't really think this is green in any fundamental sense and I don't think this does anything. Um, I really think that we, we have, um, as a species, gone down the wrong route. Uh, we've, we've become separated from our own nature, from our status as animals, uh, living in a complex ecology with other animals. And we have just decided to draw upon this reserve, uh, built up over hundreds of millions of years of carbon. Uh, and we're using that to, you know, finance our, um, wonderful lifestyle for two, three generations, uh, with no ideas how we're going to continue after that. It, this is just not 
this is not right. You know, it's sort of like any animal that decides to just eat up all the food around it with no regard for how it's going to, how, how things are going to go. I mean, nature will always step in and, and forcefully make us behave in the end. Uh, but rather than letting that take its course, perhaps we can do something ourselves to prevent that from happening. So, um, soap punk is, uh, you know, uh, I invented the term as an aesthetic to describe, um, the world I wanted to envision in, in my novels. And uh, if we have time, I'd love to actually get into that a little bit, which is, um, I, I think oftentimes people sort of, um, it's it's not, because what I'm trying to do here is actually a little bit radical. Um, so if I can just shift uh, lanes a little bit um, to to explain to, to the audience what soap punk actually means. Um, so, I came up with the idea originally because um, it struck me that modernity is a very strange experience for the vast majority of the world's people, um, ourselves included. Um, so I travel around the world quite a bit as an author um, and, and a futurist, and I get to talk to folks from around the world. And one thing that struck me is how in many parts of the world, especially the global south, um, people t tell me that they see modernity um as a translated experience for them so many people from uh africa from southeast asia from south america um you know when we have a conversation with them, you know when i converse about things like economic science technology i have to switch to using english or spanish or some language that's derived from the colonizers i i can't do it in my native indigenous tongue because we don't have the words uh for these things or they're translated from the from english or you know another uh, european language and um there's a translatedness to my experience of modernity and i was like oh yeah that that makes sense i, I definitely understand that but then i thought about it a little more and i was like actually even for English speakers, modernity has a weird translatedness to it, right? We use words like technology, chemistry, physics. These are actually not Anglo-Saxon words. The roots of these words are Greek and Latin. Um, and this goes back to the Renaissance when uh, we consciously in Europe attempted to create modernity by recovering the past. That's a very strange thing when you actually think about it a little bit. The idea of creating the future by repurposing the past. So. Um, in some sense, we all live in a Greco-Roman punk world, right? Meaning we take Greco-Roman roots and then we apply the punk aesthetic to them, which is to reappropriate and repurpose things and use them for things that they were never meant to do in their original incarnation. So we have words like technology and physics and chemistry and economics. We, when we uh, discover new species, when we invent new things, um, we have to go back to Greek and Latin roots and create new words for them. It's a very strange experience. I mean, I, I do a lot of sci-fi writing. And this is very common in sci-fi when we create neologisms. We often go back to Greek and Latin roots to describe things that have never been seen before, like fundamental particles. Very weird, right? Very strange. Um, so I said, okay, okay, this is all very cool. So we live in a Greco-Roman punk world. But what if there's another way to to envision modernity? What if I can give this sense of translatedness of modernity to everybody? Um, we don't even think of physics and chemistry and technology and these words as non-native English words anymore because they had become part of the way English forms the words. But what if I can write in fantasy and sci-fi, we're always trying to make the familiar strange. So I can do that for English speakers by writing a fantasy novel about modernity, about the invention of modernity, but instead of Greco-Roman punk, it's going to be soap punk. It's going to draw on classical East Asian roots. What if I can use classical East Asian roots to create modernity in the same way we ourselves, as modern Western um, individuals, create a modernity out of Greek and Latin roots? So that's the basic premise of what I was trying to do. Um, it's a weird thing, as far as I know, no one else had really done anything quite like this or envisioned that way. So, um, you know, a lot of times when 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 fantasy draws on non-Western tradition, what they're really trying to do is to um, talk about the indigenous aspects and to 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 celebrate the culture and 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 so on. That's not quite what I'm doing here. Uh, I'm doing something 
very different. I'm trying to give us a different sense of what modernity could be, an alternative way of looking at our own modernity and see how strange in some way it is and to experience that translatedness. Um, so, you know, I decided to create a fantasy society um, where they're going through their own version of Renaissance, their own version of, of, of um, inventing modern, a modern sense of self, a modern sense of uh, technology, uh, of a technology-based ecology. But they're doing this by drawing on um, tradition, customs, and philosophy that are clearly derived from classical East Asian roots. Um, so that's what so fun is really about. It's a story about the modern world, but it's kind of like, um, instead of the classical Greek and Roman myth, they're now drawing on East Asian equivalents. Um, and you know, that's, I had a lot of fun, uh, trying to, uh, do this and trying to re-examine modernity and my own experience of it, um, and how that feels. Um, so that ended up being, um, the, the thing that I took up a decade of my time, um, more than anything else. Amazing. Do you think because of how language has power to affect how we think about things, having um, these words come from different roots changes our perspective on the technologies themselves, even if they are quite similar to um, ones we're used to in um, Greco-Roman roots? You know, I'm not a big believer in the strong version uh, of the Sapir work thesis, you know, the strong version, which says your language determines your patterns of thinking. I really don't think there's much to that. Um, I think a very weak version of it perhaps may be true because different languages do, in fact, divide up abstractions, especially in completely different ways. So, I mean, all of us who uh, have some experience with another language can attest to this. Uh, there is just a certain different emotional quality to words that are direct translations of each other. And, and the way abstractions are divided up differently between different languages do lead you to think about them at least a little bit differently. Um, so as far as the technology stuff is concerned, this is very interesting to me because um, because of the way the way our modernity evolved, um, I do think that to a large degree, uh, the technical vocabulary that we focus on, like the vocabulary for science, for, um, for engineering, for iPhones, <laughs> uh, are actually universal. Uh, around the world, we all follow the same pattern, in the same way that programmers from around the world learn to program essentially in English because programming languages were invented here in the US and the UK. Um, so that's that's how it is. No matter what language you speak, you learn go to, <laughs> you learn for loops. I mean, that's the way it is. But um, so in some sense, you can say that, you know, the entirety of modern technology has a very deep English um, bent to it. Uh, and so we we all speak a universal language in some in some sense around the world. But if you look a little bit broader beyond that, um, at the social aspect of it, I think that actually is not quite true anymore. Um, socially, we do have very different relationships to technology. Um, so, for example, in East Asia, um, in Japan and China, there have been long traditions discussing the 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 sense in which machines feel alien, the ways in which machines feel um, intrusive. It's, it's a cyborg kind of experience. Uh, and I think that has to do with the fact that uh, contemporary Western traditions of engineering are grafted onto these indigenous cultures in a way that does not feel entirely native and de derived. I mean, you know, this is an ongoing gen process that would take centuries uh, for this Western derived uh, technology vocabulary to feel entirely native. So that's not surprising. Um, but even just looking at, you know, the Anglophone world, uh, there's something very interesting going on here. Um, it wasn't until uh, just a few years ago that I realized that um, in English, the words for story, story in history, um, these are all not, again, they're not native Anglo-Saxon words. They were taken in uh, as a result of the Norman conquest. Uh, so they ultimately come to us from Latin. Uh, and for the longest time, history and story were not really distinguished. History and story in English actually meant interchangeably the same thing. It was until fairly recently that we separated them out. But so I got curious and I was like, well, surely 
the Anglo-Saxon told stories, so they must have a word for it, and I'm, I'm sure that word is still around. So I looked it up, um, and it turns out that prior to the displacement of the native word uh, by story, um, the word for story in Anglo-Saxon was bell, um, and that usage survives in the gospel, uh, which is good spell, good story. So, and, and in Bewo, um, I, uh, uh, as you read, uh, they talk about spells all the time, telling a tale, a, a good spell, weave a spell, literally. Um, and it, it's, it's wonderful because um, spell got displaced from its original meaning of story, and then later on became an incantation with magical effects. But I feel like uh, that usage is actually very beautiful because stories are the closest thing we have to magic, right? So, so going back to technology again, right? I think humans are really interesting. Um, it would be so cool to eventually discover an alien species and see if they have the same tendency that we do of recasting everything in terms of stories. So, um, uh, so let me give you some examples, right? Uh, I actually think that humans are, I don't know how, but we evolved somehow to understand the world through story and primarily through story. Um, data and, and, and reason and logic and all these things, they take a lot of effort for us to work through and to be convinced of something because of that. Um, but we are much more drawn to and we're much more compelled by good stories. Good stories are much more important than good data and, 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 and uh, good reason. Um, the, the way, the reason you support a candidate versus another is largely because their story resonates with you in some way. And we have a hard time understanding anything that isn't narratively consistent. Um, it's, it's the reason why people have so much trouble with things like the theory of evolution. We, we, we like to tell a story about, we want to tell the story about how, you know, these single cell creatures evolved to be more complex. And then that there's a yearning towards intelligence, towards us, towards us as the pinnacle. We, we like to tell the story of evolution as some sort of teleological process. We, we have, we have a shape to it. If there's no shape, we don't feel satisfied. The, the idea that things can just be random, that we somehow make up reasons for it afterwards. We don't like it, even though that's true. I mean, you know, as you think about your life, a lot of things that end up being important to you were initially caused by randomness, by chance. You know, who you sat down next to in class, um, why you picked this profession over another, why you settled this city over another. A lot of it is by chance. But then afterwards, you try to form a story out of it. Um, Robert Frost has this beautiful poem about uh, two girls diverging in the wood. Um, it's often misunderstood, I think. I think people take it very seriously as, as, as this, you know, poem about the importance of every little decision. Um, and Frost actually originally wrote it as a joke uh, because uh, his his friend, uh, I think it was Edward Thomas, had a habit of always hesitating and regretting over whatever path they picked on their hikes. So Robert Frost wrote the poem as a joke to make fun of his friend. Uh, and, and Frost often said, you know, I read this in front of college students and they all look so serious and they all listen to it so intently and they never seem to get the joke. The joke comes in the last stanza where the the poem says something like, you know, um, I'm not quoting exactly, but it's something like, years and years from now, I will recall this moment. And and, and, and I I will say that two rows diverged in the wood and I took the, le to, took the one less travel by and that has made all the difference. But it's actually a rationalization. It's actually a story, right? If you read the poem, the, the poet is saying, I saw these two paths diverge and they all look they look about the same. Um, you know, one is not really any less travel than the other. I'm just sort of impulsively pick one over the other. But later on, I know that decades from now on, when I tell the story, that is not how I'm going to tell it. Because if I just say I'm impulsively picking one versus the other, it's not a good story. So I'm going to say, I pick the one that's traveled by, and that has made all the difference. I mean, seriously, go back and read it. You'll see it's a joke. It's not, it's, it's making fun of this rationalization tendency we have of making up a story to justify what we do. Not really about um, deep philosophical, you know, points. I mean, it is too, but this is really the much more obvious interpretation. And I really like that because I think it's such a great illustration of how um, how we are a storytelling species. We're obsessed with stories. We'd love to 
bend the universe into a story um, that that fits. Um, and so uh, to wrap this all around, a story is a spell we cast on the world. Not only do we make sense of the world with it, we change the world with it, right? Because stories are what ultimately compels us to invent things, to discover things, to do things, uh, to, I mean, you know, modern nation states uh, don't compel people to fight anymore at point of sword, but people do die for modern nation states and we ask them to die all the time for a story. That's all it is. I mean, stories are the most important thing in our lives. We ask people to sacrifice everything they've got for the sake of a story. Um, it is, in fact, stories are the most important thing. Um, but what is democracy but a shared story we all tell ourselves? And these are things we're willing to die for. Um, so stories are magic. They are spells. They are the most important technology we have. And also the, important, the most important form of magic. Good stories are so much more important than almost any other kind of technology. Um, I mean, that's a self-serving opinion, of course, you know what I do, but I think it's true too. Yeah, even now, like when you're you're speaking to us, you are just um, making sounds, and those sounds are conjuring up images in our heads, and that's like a kind of telepathic magic thing that's, that you can do. It's like a special power you have. You have this power to cause internal states within other people we are magical creatures i mean you know i don't think we appreciate enough how incredible it is that we can do this i mean like you say we're able to mirror and imagine someone else's mental state i mean it's not gonna be an exact copy of course but it's it's pretty darn impressive that we can do this just by you know doing this right across the globe um it's incredible to think about it. I, I, I really think that if we describe the way humans communicate and imagine and, and make sense of the world in using the vocabulary of fantasy novels, everybody would realize it's magic. We're, we're engaged in magic custom. Brings me on to my next question, actually, which is also about kind of like an everyday magic. Uh, we're used to language, so we don't think of it as magic, perhaps. In the paper menagerie short story, origami animals are given life through the loving breath of a mother for her son. At one point, her son is playing with another child who has a modern animatronic toy that is able to move because of technology. This child has become so desensitized to the independent movement of objects, like they have an animus inside them, that he doesn't react with any surprise to the lifelike movement of paper at all. Do you think that in the modern day, we are even capable of recognizing magic if it did appear to us? Or in context with our uh, conversation before, would we ever realize how magical language is? Oh, wow. Um, yeah. Well, man, that is that is a great way to look at it. Um, I mean, if, if magic you know, occurred right now, would we even realize that it's magic because we live in such a a world in which at the same time miracles are accepted as common and and we we've forgotten our own magical natures um i i i i'm an optimist so i like to think that we can always recover that sense of wonder that sense of magic i mean just uh to give you another um very concrete example of this um i've i've done a lot of my research and a lot of my um thinking uh, into the the disease of modernity, for lack of a better term, which is um, this tendency for peoples around the world to adopt a translated sense of modernity without really making it indigenous and native to their own land. So, for example, in large parts of the global south, um, people have abandoned traditional construction techniques in favor of concrete. Uh, but concrete is often not the right building material for different climates and, and local conditions. If you're prone to earthquakes, for example, unreinforced concrete is a terrible, terrible building material to use. Schools will collapse and when there's an earthquake and people can die from it. Um, they don't last as long as native materials. They don't, they don't, they're not repairable. They're just terrible in so many ways. And yet lots of communities adopt these materials because they view them as symbols of modernity using concrete construction is better than traditional construction but it's just not it's just not true we seem to have boxed ourselves in in a way that feels deeply unsatisfying right i was um 
So uh, my wife and I, we homeschool our children. So more recently, I was looking into architecture and discussing uh, with the kids about uh, the houses we live in and, and how um, uh, construction of homes have changed over time. And I was looking into um, Roman style houses and how they have um, this setup where, um, so, you know, recently it's been really hot. I'm sure you've experienced that too. And so we had to leave the AC on and uh, my daughter and I were like, why is this so hot? How do people in the past live when, without air conditioning? It's, it's just unbelievable. So we looked into it. Turns out that, um, so the Romans had these houses with um, a central courtyard and slanting roofs that all sort of let down to the middle. So the rainwater will be collected in the middle and there will be a little pool. And the pool served two purposes. There's an underground cistern that collected the water and the water after being filtered can be used for everyday drinking and washing and so on. But the above ground portion, the pool, served as a natural air conditioner. It evaporated and then just cooled down the entire courtyard. So if you lived in a Roman house like that, you would just sit in the courtyard during the day and it's very comfortable, very wonderful. Um, a lot of these um, houses also had their own um, gardens and vineyards. And if you into a vineyard or something, you'll realize how wonderful it is to sit under the leaves in the summer. And it's very cool. It's very comfortable. So uh, my daughters were looking at this and we were like, oh, that's so different, right? It's, it's a very different way of thinking about constructing houses. It's about opening up the house to the movement of air outside. It's about being actually outside. It's about using the house only for shelter, for sleeping conducting your life in, in the open. I mean, this is the Greek and Roman ideal. You lived your life in the open, if you could, um, and, and exposed to the outside because, again, we're animals. We're meant to be in that open air. Um, but modern houses are the direct opposite. We build them almost like space capsules. We, we, we make them airtight so that air conditioning can actually work. We make them unbreathable. Um, the materials we use are so unnatural that they're full of toxins that we discovered decades after the fact. It's it's bizarre. We think we know everything there is to know, and yet we know so much less than our ancestors, it seems, about the, how to construct a house that doesn't heat up too much. I mean, just insane. Like, my wife and I were traveling, and we went up to um, a vacation home, and they had a roof made of rubber, and, and, and it was... It, it was incredibly hot during the day and then i was like this is unbearable like they did not used to make houses like this. it's 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 weird that the more we progress the the worse we seem to get at these very basic things so back to your original point um lily i think um we are so obsessed with our ability to control the world around us to make our own world independent of the world that already exists that we've forgotten a ton of lessons that we learned over the millennia during which we were not so capable and we had to sort of live with nature rather than dominating it. Um, and we've forgotten so many lessons that we've learned over time about how to be um, a, 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 just a part of the ecology around us rather than something uh, that stands apart and outside of it. Um, we have forgotten in some ways the soul that animated ourselves and our constructions. We used to make things that were alive, that were just literally extensions of ourselves. We used to make things that were more like beaver dams. Uh, but now we're we're doing something very different. We're we're not seeing ourselves as part of the world around us. We try to keep ourselves away from it to seal ourselves in. We act like we're in a hostile world and we have to enclose ourselves entirely from it. Uh, but that's poison. It's, it's, it's causing us to become sicker and less healthy and, and, and just overall um, more unhappy. Um, and, and we need to reverse that if we can get around it. It also has a kind of inefficiency to it. Like the comparison of using your surroundings to be your air conditioning is so much better than having to like build a whole air conditioning unit, bring the energy to run the air conditioning unit and make the conditions for the air conditioning unit to work in your house. While researching this podcast, we came across the idea of ephemeralization, a term coined by Buckminster Fuller, which basically is the ability of technological advancement to do more and more with less and less until eventually you can do everything with nothing. 
like how in your example, the Romans uh, managed to do more and more improving their life with stuff that was already around them in their ecosystem. So they didn't need to bring in all this extra stuff to make their lives better. That feels like the essence of magic, being able to conjure something out of nothing, whether it's a bouquet of flowers from your sleeve or unlimited computational power for a godlike artificial intelligence. Where in the great progress bar of human evolution do you think we are in this journey? Ah, uh, it's always tough, right, to sort of reflect on where you are and to accurately assess where you are. Um, I would say that we're much farther along in some ways than we think, and we're also um, much less advanced than we think among other dimensions. Um, I think, you know, let, let's not, you know, I'm not saying that somehow all the progress is fake, that technology hasn't actually done a lot of good. We have done a lot of good. I mean, you know, infant mortality is down uh, tremendously from historical uh, trends. Uh, the fact that we're able to save so many more of us and to live longer um, is an undeniable fact. So we need to celebrate that, that we're actually able to make advances and do this. Um, but at the same time, um, there are other things that we seem to be not very good at and, and we're not even recognizing we're not very good at it. Um, your point about, you know, being able to do more with less is incredibly important because that's the essence of technology. We think of technology as a, as a lever, um, as a force multiplier that we can do more and be more productive mm -hmm. and, and consume more and know more and so on and so forth. I mean, you know, the present humans who are alive today have read more books, we know more facts. We have communicated with more people. We have read more stories. We have seen more movies. Everything that any generation in the past, you know, our lives are richer by those measures than any generation in the past. And yet, at the same time, we have problems recognizing the cost of what we're doing. So I think our biggest problem is we think we're doing more with less, when in fact, the cost of what we're doing is just pushed away and quote unquote invisible to us, right? Um, the the idea that you're moving a hundred fifty pound human around um, by moving seven thousand pounds of metal <laughs> around with it all the time um, that imposes a cost. It's just that for about a century, we the cost was invisible to us. Um, you know, what difference does it make that this there's a huge amount of pollution being generated. What difference does it make that we're making the environment so much worse? What difference does it make that we're building roads all over the place and destroying um, patterns of, of uh, that birds and, and animals and plants have set up over uh, millions of years? What difference does it make that everything's going extinct? Um, Eventually, when we have destroyed all the ecology around us, we will also no longer be able to survive. You may think that we can build, you know, our houses like spaceships, but we cannot as a whole live in a spaceship. We just can't. That's not what we're meant to do. We don't have the ability to do that. Um, we all live on this one planet and then when we mess it up, it's gone. So um, we... I guess the thing that I, I think we need to do more than anything else is to recognize the cost of what we're doing, not just in terms of physical cost to the environment, not just in terms of, of doing the carbon calculations and whatnot, but also in terms of uh, the social technologies we have. Um, we have a lot of problems with trolling, with fake news, with disinformation. These are all also um, types of acts that we do that where you feel very powerful because you can achieve so much with seemingly so little. But again, you're imposing the cost on everybody else around you in a way that's not directly obvious to you. Um, and, and the erosion of trust in our institutions, in each other, in democracy as a whole, in humanity, um, it's, it's, it's deeply disturbing. The greatest harm that we've done um, is to the idea of stories that we can believe in. You know, I think uh, one of the great cri crises facing the U.S., um, and I'm sure other um, countries as well, is a general lack of faith in the stories that we used to faith in. Uh, this is not always a bad thing, because 
some of those stories that we used to believe in were in fact not good stories. But a general lack of faith by a country's citizens in its own story is, is a bad, is a very bad thing. Um, you know, uh, Gibbon used to say, right, uh, that, you know, an empire is not, it cannot fall from external forces until it has become cor corrupted from within. But I think in the modern age, I think a people cannot be destroyed or fall until they have lost faith in their own story. I think that's the modern version of it. And I think a lot of us are in some faith in our own stories, in our own country stories. And that is uh, a very terrible thing. And that is something that we really have to work on. Um, uh, the U.S. being in some ways the focus of a lot of uh, the world's attention is a great example of the struggle over the soul of the country of, of what is the story that we're supposed to rally around? How do we get people to believe in the story again? But I don't think it's a unique American problem. I think it's true around the world. Um, a lot of countries, a lot of governments are facing a crisis of faith. Um, and so I think a lot about how do we fix the stories that we tell each other? How do we fix the, the stories that, um, we're weaving? Um, so this may seem like a tangent, but it's very much related to everything we've talked about so far. Um, AI is, you know, a very big topic right now. We're always talking about how AI changes creativity. People are, love these mean paintings being generated by AI and so on. Um, one of the things that's, uh, that's been uh, troubling me a little bit is the degree to which AI and machine learning uh, don't seem to have changed or modernized or revolutionized storytelling in a fundamental way. Um, so, um, you know, my wife is a photographer and she uses machine learning in her work constantly. I mean, all those filters and enhancements and, and so on, that's all done by machine learning. Um, we now have entire generation or two generations of people who have grown up largely uh, seeing the world in photographs that had been machine learning enhanced. I mean, we don't really think about what that means, but the vast majority of the photographs we see are taken by phones with very advanced machine learning chips that modify the image in ways that we find pleasing. So our visual aesthetic has been shaped by machines for, you know, more than a generation now. Um, I, I wish, you know, Susan Sontag, uh, <laughs> um, if she could write about this, this, this will be deeply fascinating. It will be like an update to, um, on photography about the wonders of machine learning photography. It's just very, very interesting. Um, but, uh, in music too, um, uh, uh, AI has done a lot to a lot of commercial music generation, um, and, and, and commercial video production and even games. Um, but in fiction writing, for some reason, um, machine learning just doesn't seem to have played a large role. Novelists today write pretty much the same way they wrote in the time of Dickens or earlier. It just it doesn't seem to have altered things that much. So I was looking to why that is. Why is that AI has not changed our storytelling that much? But the more I looked into it, the 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 more I realized that I was actually sort of wrong because. It turns out that the most important stories we tell ourselves are collective stories. They're stories that we form by talking to each other. It's collective myth making, collective storytelling. That's what civilization is. That's what democracy is. It's just a collective story we try to tell ourselves. In that realm, AI has played a huge role. We just didn't realize it. Um, you know, the degree to which the 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 stories you read and consume these days are heavily mediated by machine learning, your Facebook feed, your Twitter feed, your Instagram feed, your, the books you're recommended by Amazon, the, the things you see on the web and the things that are ignored, you know, what Apple news chooses to present to me versus what it chooses to hide the, the degree to which these algorithms are encouraging engagement with trolls, with people who are deliberately provoking a uh, bad conversation. Our collective storytelling is now heavily machine mediated and algorithmically generated. And we have not thought about it very much. We're, the way we discuss this is often in terms of, you know, this information, we just got to filter out the, the, the bad actors and, and the market of, you know, the marketplace of ideas is still functioning just fine. Um, 
I think the problem is much more fundamental in the same way that these machine learning filters are changing the way we perceive reality visually. The way we tell stories, the way we think about stories, the way we think about what stories are convincing, what stories we like, what stories we choose to believe in. This has all been altered by machine learning, by algorithms, by, by, by these platforms that we lock ourselves into um, for more than a decade now, decade and a half, maybe two decades, depending on how you count. Um, and we, we're not doing enough to think about it, to, to, to really examine this, to really tease apart what is working and what isn't. Um, it's almost as if we decided to completely, you know, go into body modification without really thinking about how we're turning ourselves into cyborgs. Um, it feels like we're doing that. We just threw ourselves into a machine mediated collective storytelling experience without thinking through what that means. Um, and that to me is, um, both the most magical thing that occurred in my lifetime and also the scariest thing. Um, I, I, a lot of my fiction more recently is trying to engage with this idea of how do we tell a story with the machine? How do we connect with each other? through machines? How do we remain human or, or figure out what it means to even be human uh, in a world that essentially where the machine is the most important medium of them all? Uh, and it's, you know, it's, uh, it's complicated. It's heady. It's, it's, it's something that I don't have the words for. I'm, I'm, I'm struggling with. I mean, all of that's exactly why it's so important that there's diversity of thoughts and representation in things like data science and AI, because if it's all basically middle-aged straight white guys who are developing you know, algorithms and uh, data science, then all these biases are just going to be baked in so much harder for so much longer, and it's going to be harder and harder to undo them. Uh, it's a big thing that the data lab's trying to fix. But uh, that some of that actually brings us on to the next thing we we're going to ask you about, uh, which is the singularity. You know, everybody's favorite. Um, hopefully, not too close, but maybe closer than we think. Paradigm shift. So, in your collection of short stories, uh, the Hidden Girl, uh, there's a series of interconnected uh, stories about the singularity, which has now been adapted into a beautiful TV series uh, on AMC, which sadly we don't get in the UK. Um, throughout the stories, one of the key themes is how humanity reacts to the ascension of human consciousness beyond its corporeal form and into the digital realm. Uh, it was really interesting that there were two siblings, uh, one biological and one digital, uh, both of whom had like, massively different perceptions of time due to the difference in their computational powers. Um, what do you think the societal and familial impacts of this kind of ascension would be? Well, you know, first of all, um, I, I do want to say that I'm actually somewhat skeptical um, of the concept of the singularity. Um, it, it's one of those things where the story is too neat for me to really believe that it's going to be true. Um, the idea of the singularity, the idea that we're all going to be uploaded into the machine and moving the cloud as gods, is you know this very old myth among tech enthusiasts, and it's it's been true. It's been a thing that. We talk about in Silicon Valley for decades, and if you talk to people, they're always telling you that it's going to be, it's going to happen within the next twenty years or so. I mean, it's been like that for sixty years, so who knows? Um, I'm I'm very skeptical about it because I, I you know, a, a persistent theme of my work as a futurist is that um, science fiction is actually really, really, really bad at predicting the future. Um, if that's what you're interested in. Um, sci-fi has never had a good track record of predicting the future. Uh, and that's largely because we as humans are very story driven. Um, and we like things to follow a merry storyline. So when we imagine the future, what we often do is to take existing trends and extrapolate them out and then try to see, this is the cause of your the effect. This is how things will play out. Um, but the reality is the, the history of technology it is largely not like that. The stories often make sense afterwards, but looking forward, it's very hard to tell how things are going to go. Um, uh, if you can predict the future uh, and you're not just lucky, uh, obviously you will make a lot of money from it. And, and, and there are not that many sci-fi writers will have a lot of money because we're not very good at predicting the future. <laughs> um, 
but all that aside, I I also um, think that sci-fi actually is very good at one thing, which is to give us the vocabulary and to give us the mental um, exercises necessary to deal with cataclysmic change. That's probably the greatest thing that sci-fi is good for. Now, we may not be able to predict the exact disruption and revolution that's going to happen, but we can get you to think about what is essential in the life that you live now as you have it. What is not so essential? How would you react to a major change? How would you react if your profession no longer exists? How how would you deal with it when um, machines can do the task we do now better than you? How how would you you know shift? Um, so even if the singularity does not happen the way that sci-fi writers are imagining it or the way I'm imagining it. Um, I feel the singularity story is really to explore the idea of what is essentially human in the post-human world. I mean, however post-humanism will come about, I do think we'll get there. Um, whether it's biological, cybernetic, philosophical, who knows how we'll get to post-humanism. But we need to examine the question of what does it mean to be human and, and what are the things we want to keep about being human and then what are the things we can we can perhaps reject and modify and, and what are the things we need to re-examine and reconstitute um that's what those singularity stories are really about um and i think a lot about um what it is that that we want to hold on to you know this tendency we have of telling stories and of casting spells on each other is that something so wonderful that we want to maintain it? Is that something that's deeply irrational that we want to reject? Is it something that perhaps a little bit of both and we can enhance some aspect of it and reject the mass other aspect of it? Can we perhaps, I don't know, stop conspiracy theories and which is also a form of collective storytelling, uh, but enhance, um, other forms of collective storytelling that are positive. Um, I, uh, there's no doubt that we're already living in a world in which, you know, our collective storytelling and, and individual storytelling are enhanced and, and changed by uh, machines in a way that's very profound. Um, but it's not the first time humans have gone through such a change, right? Um, if you read Plato and, and, um, and, and the dialogues, you know, Plato was, had this very famous objection to writing. We talked about writing as a technology that's deeply infantilizing and, and it, it fools you into thinking you have wisdom when in fact you don't and it makes you think you know something but you don't know anything it's 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 a false kind of knowledge um but the reality is you know writing has changed the way we think uh but it, you know going back to magic again um i can do math problems by writing things down that i can never do in my head i mean to go back and look at the the calculus and the uh, the linear algebra I did by means of writing these symbols down. It's magic, right? We're able to externalize a part of our brain and extend our working memory onto this tape medium. Um, we are freaking unbelievable. I mean, what other animal can do this? You know, that we, we actually take part of our brain, these patterns, and we make it tangible, put it out in the world and allow the world to serve as a canvas, as a working memory for it. That is just, oh my God, it's unbelievable. If you describe some alien species doing this, you know, it would blow people's minds. Such, such wonder. Um, so now that we have the ability to have even more intimate machine brain interface and to really extend our working memory into machines, what wonders will there be? I mean, I remember when I was in high school trying to make sense of the computer assisted proof of the four color theorem um it was one of the first math theorems proven by computer and i couldn't make sense of it i, I was like how can i trust this how can i make sense of this but imagine that you know your brain um your cognitive capabilities enhanced by machines whether it's because you're uploaded or because you just had more implants Imagine being able to actually follow that, to understand that, to hold all of that in your head. I mean, what other wondrous stories will we be able to tell? Um, we're already doing incredible things, right? I mean, think about the experience of binge watching, right? 
um, we're now telling some of the most complicated stories ever devised by the human imagination. These multi-season, multi plot line, massive TV shows, um, you can't even follow them without reading a wiki, right? The wiki is the collective externalization of your story imagining brain for you to be able to follow this. Um, any authors like George R. R. Martin actually require a wiki to even write their story. I had to keep a wiki to write my own fantasy. I mean, we're now able to do that. We're able to like create more complicated stories because of it. Just imagine what kind of wonders, wonders stories we can tell and consume once our brains are enhanced, um, uh, and and what new relationships will come about. Um, anyway, it's it's all really fun crazy to think about, but I, I love imagining that world in which we have more beautiful stories that are incomprehensible and unimaginable uh, to us today. Uh, that is a future I would love to see. Uh, the final book in the Dandelion Dynasty series has just been published. Uh, you can get Speaking Bones in your local bookshop, or you can ask them to order it in. Also, uh, all the covers for that series are so beautiful. Um, I just Oh, I love them. It's so, so nice. So I highly recommend everyone goes and Googles that. Um, the whole series is beautiful and immersive and really it's just, it's a gorgeous experience. Um, and we'd love to talk a little bit about this. Um, so we've kind of discussed this a bit before, but um, humans are predisposed to create technology. Uh, but obviously the materials around us uh, will vastly differ depending on where you are in the world. Um, so how does Silkpunk develop different technological solutions which are functionally isomorphic and socially comparable to other like alternate history aesthetics like steampunk? So um, uh, I think the best way to think about it is, you know, Silkpunk, as I mentioned earlier, is an alternative way to reimagine modernity and to force us to rethink about, um, to experience in some ways, the translatedness of modernity for all of us. Um, and having done it uh it, it made me rethink a lot about our decision right um it, it's, it's really interesting because it turns out that the the most environmentally friendly thing you can do is to um make things with locally available materials and to minimize the amount of massive logistic transportation that you have to do the more the less you have to do with that the better so if you're gonna cook and you know it's better to cook at home than it is to go buy meals out outside the home it's better to use locally available ingredients than to have fruits and, and, and meats shipped in from thousands of miles away um that's generally true a lot a lot of our decisions in the modern world are based on the idea of shipping things across the globe because it's more efficient uh, economically, it's it's this whole idea that you you want to have comparative advantage in different parts of the world, specializing different things. Um, but this is really a false kind of efficiency because, as I mentioned earlier, the cost of doing this sort of thing is often invisible to us or deliberately disguised, so you just don't see it. Um, uh, and where were the cost to be made actually visible to everyone, it would just be staggering. And soap punk is very much about as much as possible using material that's available locally close to you and making reinventing things and remaking things that are indigenous, um, that feel indigenous. So if there's one overriding principle in silk punk in all the imagined cultures that I talk about is that they all talk about adaptation and adaption and, 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 and learning and, and taking an idea from someone else and really make it your own by recrafting it using your own technology vocabulary. So, for example, you know, in, in modern terms, would be you watch these wonderful concrete and steel and glass buildings from elsewhere. You don't recreate it literally that way in your native environment. You use what's locally available, and you take the parts that are that feel new, that feel interesting, that feel like a good story to you. And you retell that story using your own vocabulary, you're using your own materials. You don't just blindly copy, you reinvent, you really make it your own. 
Um, that above all is, is the point. Um, there are lots of wonderful lessons you can learn by observing people from afar, but you have to remember that they came up with those solutions because it's uniquely suited to their own conditions. You cannot just blindly take that and apply it to your own world and abandon everything you've done before, because there's a reason why you've spent thousands of years developing these solutions and there are good in those solutions too. You have to figure out a way to reinvent modernity for yourself, to retranslate, if you will, um, and until it feels native to you. Um, and so if I can go back to another linguistic metaphor, the modern vernaculars we have um, uh, in Europe, the modern vernacular languages all came out of a deep engagement with the classics during the Renaissance. You know, So I'll just use the example of English, because uh, that's the one most familiar to me. Writers like Chaucer, Shakespeare, Milton, um, Spencer, these were the great English poets who invented modern English, as we know it. They were all deeply classical readers. And in fact, many of them were classical writers. Milton, you know, famously was the Latin secretary for Cromwell, and he wrote in Latin a lot of his own works. And if you read Milton's works, you'll notice that there's a really interesting engagement with translatedness in his own work. When he wrote Paradise Lost, there are large sections of it that read deeply unnatural as English. It's because he was trying to apply classical Latin syntax to English. Um, but English is not a um, strongly inflected language the way Latin is. So a lot of the stuff just doesn't work. And yet he was trying to write English as though it were Latin. And then later on, as you see his aesthetic evolve, he evolved away from that. He could, he could take some of these Latin rhetorical ideas and tropes and reinvent them in English so they become part of the native English repertoire of tools that poets and writers in the future can use. That's the kind of reinvention and, 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 and localization that I want to see, which is you don't just blindly adapt a global universal technology vocabulary. You don't just blindly copy whatever they do in LA and say, this is going to work everywhere. No. You, you you take these ideas and you examine them and you apply the punk aesthetic of breaking them down and rebuilding them and reconstituting them using uh, other vocabulary that is native, that is indigenous, that is local and specific to where you are, to your environment. And you rebuild it, remake it until now it feels like yours. It's something that you actually own. Um, that's what I think the future of globalization will be out of The future of globalization should not be one universal vocabulary and language, whether it's technology or anything else, but much more local, much more regional, much more um, indigenous, but taking good ideas from afar and, and remaking them uh, in the vocabulary that is native, that does fit with the environment that we're living in. We're not building space capsules. That's not who we are. We need to be open to the environment and build things that actually feel like they fit. It's funny when you when you talk about this, I agree with it like 100%, but then when I find myself in nature, I feel so very uncomfortable. You know, I'm just like a deeply uncomfortable person when it comes to like hiking, walking, swimming, any of these things. I, I need to get better at this. I'm an absolute disaster of a human being. You've become conditioned to your space capsule. Exactly. I, I've, I really love my little space capsule. It's really comfortable. I've got Wi-Fi and everything. It's, it's great. <laughs> Does, see, the thing is, it doesn't have to be a case where you're either in the wilderness or you're in a space capsule. There's in between. I mean, like the Roman example I was giving you, Romans were living in this environment uh, where they build their houses to be open to nature, but it was not untamed. I mean, it's not like they're in the mountains constantly, they're in this environment they crafted with natural materials um, that allow them to cool themselves. That is also an ideal, this idea that you can reshape the environment, of course, because all animals do it, but you can reshape the environment in a way that doesn't cost, impose a huge amount of cost from afar and, and, and think cost that you can, that you're, you're passing on to future generations. Um, there are ways we can do this using what is right there 
um, available, uh, not just the materials, but also the wisdom uh, of the people around us native to a local to our community. After this podcast, I'm going to go and open all the windows. Exactly, right? Yeah. You know, let all the let nature in. It's a beautiful south side of Glasgow. Yeah, luckily <laughs> uh, it's quite warm. Yeah. Airships make some wonderful appearances in the Dandelion Dynasty books. You paint a beautiful image of them and they feel completely harmonious with their surroundings. It's interesting that airships are a common feature in various other punk subgenres, such as steampunk and diesel punk, and even make their way into popular culture references, such as in Kimmy Schmidt. But it's likely that the most obvious example that most people would come up with, if you ask them, can you name an airship, would be the Hindenburg. What do you think is behind the enduring appeal of airships, despite the most famous one being so disastrous? Um, airships are such a fascinating um, uh, case study for what I'm talking about, which is the the weird path dependency of technology, right? Um, so... Um, Airships basically were wiped out as a viable technology uh, branch as a result of the Hindenburg disaster. But that disaster is largely a matter of accident. Um, and, 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 and it happened because of history. I mean, the reason it happened was because uh, the U.S. was no longer selling helium to the Germans. And so they had no choice but to resort to using hydrogen which everybody knew was not a good idea, but they did it. And of course, the result is this disaster and, and, and um, the rest is history, if you will. Uh, had, world, had the world wars not occurred, <laughs> you know, had these cities didn't go the way they did, we probably would be in a world full of airships now, but um, that's just the way it is. You know, we, we don't, we don't, the, the world, the timeline we're in is the time we're in and, and it is what it is. I think, Airships hold an enduring uh, appeal to people because um, they do exemplify in a lot of ways what I was talking about. Rather than burning just gallons and gallons of, of, of high jet fuel to keep these metal machines up in the air, airships don't require any energy. They're passively lifted. They don't. They're, they don't generate active lift. They're passively lifted. So, in terms of energy costs, airships are like a bazillion times more environmentally friendly than airplanes would be. Um, now, they're not going to travel as fast, uh, but that's okay. It's not as if we're all jetting around the world on supersonic jets. We tried that for a while, and it turned out that we don't actually need to go to places that quickly. It turns out getting to from London to New York in two hours is not quite as critical as we thought. Taking <laughs> uh, a few more hours, it's all right. Um, so I, I, I don't, I don't, I think airships do have a viable future, uh, and there are companies working on this. Um, perhaps in the beginning, airships will have to stay in some very specific uh, niche applications. But the fact that they cost so little energy to operate, and that they can stay aloft without active generating active lift is a huge advantage. There are definitely applications where that kind of um, uh, advantage will outweigh all the disadvantages. Um, I also think there's a, there's a, there's an aspect to airships that appeals that's entirely irrational, which is just that they evoke a good story. They're, they're more beautiful to us. They, they are associating our minds with a more leisurely and more romantic style of travel. There's something very graceful and romantic about them that we just like. Um, I it, it's it's like you know the same reason people still go on cruise ships and, and um, there's a kind of romance to that kind of story that we enjoy. Um, and perhaps uh, you know that's the direction we should lean into uh, is to focus on the story and to make um, airships as a form of um, uh, relatively environmentally friendly tourism uh, that could work. Because I can imagine, for example, I mean, I'm not saying that this is a viable business idea just yet, but I can imagine running airship cruises similar to uh, cruise ships. You know, you have cruise ships going up the, the inside passage to Alaska or around the Mediterranean or the Caribbean. What if you had, say, an airship uh, cruise that went to the Amazon uh, or or something like that, where you can retreat back to your airship 
and safety. And then you can have little excursions as the airship skims over the jungle to go down there and check it out. It would impose much less environmental cost than building a road into the jungle or building an airport or anything else. I mean, airships are so, have so much uh, more, uh, they, they, they can just do, they can leave the environment largely undamaged if you bring tourism uh, to different parts of the world using it. So um, I don't know, maybe, maybe that's something for people to look into, um, whether uh, airship cruises can become a thing uh, to visit remote parts of the world without um, the damage of building infrastructure that allows cars and trucks and those sort of things. And um, airships can leave that largely alone and still get you to enjoy those places that you can't enjoy otherwise. I, I think that can be kind of cool uh, and maybe uh, something that we'll see in the future. I really hope so. I would love an airship cruise. That, mm-hmm. That'd be amazing. I, also, I don't like moving very fast. So, you know, I, I, an airship cruise would be absolutely right up my street. Also, planes terrify me. You know, I mean, <laughs> just I, they, they just shouldn't work. I think they are an affront to nature <laughs> and I don't trust them, don't like them. So the uh, height part is okay, but it's the, the way they fly you don't It's like. the way they fly, okay. yeah. Um, and this is all just one big justification for me to not visit my in-laws. You know, so, you know, I just have to pretend I hate planes. Listen, you, you could also just tell yourself that you can also tell them you're you're really trying to save the environment because, you know, by not jetting around like Taylor Swift, you're doing <laughs> exactly. a lot to save the environment. I would like to think so. And that is definitely what I'm going to tell them next week when I see them. <laughs> <laughs> uh, actually, we, another word we came across when we were researching this was uh, automagically, uh, which is when a like, massively complex technology just works and you take it for granted. And um, I feel that way about almost everything. With that said, I think it might be time for some wild speculation. This is the part of the show where we ask our guests to go beyond the scope of their research or expertise and engage in some wild speculation about their field. Ken, if silk punk technology became the predominant foundation of human civilization, what do you think the future would look like? (laughs) That that is really wild. (laughs) I, I, uh, wow. Uh, I don't, okay. The thing that I think would be most, um, awesome, uh, for me to imagine would be, um, a soap punk, uh, expedition to Mars. Uh, I think that would be very cool to imagine what that would look like. Um, one of the things that I ended up, I mean, this is not really a, a big spoiler, but it is a little bit of a spoiler, uh, which is, um, later on in the series, uh, one of the um, obsessions that the characters get into uh, in terms of innovation is the idea of teaching machines that can, uh, uh, building machines that can be taught. Uh, so some form of, of, they're not exactly general purpose computers, but they're machines that can be instructed uh, and, and programmed in some sense. Um, I've always wanted to, uh, I actually worked out this entire uh, series of technology of building uh, instructable machines based on the principles of complex looms uh, in traditional Chinese um, technology. Uh, these are very complicated looms that can be used to, can be programmed to generate all sorts of patterns. Um, and that becomes the basis for a series of computing machinery. Um, so. What I was wondering is whether, you know, how we would solve the same kind of calculation problems using these kind of machines. Uh, so just imagine a future, right, in which it's not uh, uh, computers, uh, digital computers with logic gates, but rather uh, analog computing machines uh, that are largely constructed using uh, the, the idea of modeling the problem, using an analog model and trying to work them through. Um, it's kind of amazing for me to think about solving the problems of celestial navigation uh, and and uh, uh, trying to get from Earth to Mars using computers, uh, in quotes, uh, that function along silk punk principles. Um, that's something wild and crazy. I haven't actually uh, worked it through because uh, I'm just coming up with the idea now. Uh, but that would be really cool. That would be really cool. Mm. Actually, uh, the first podcast we recorded was with uh, Laura Tripoldi, a um, nanotechnologist, and in her book, she talks about how the first first algorithm or first programmable machine was a loom. Mm-hmm. 
Yes, looms were incredibly important to uh, early human societies. I mean, I think uh, even in Europe, one of the first machines that gave inspiration to general purpose computers was a loom, right? They, they, they figured out how to do it. And also, um, you know, analog computing is actually uh, more of a thing now uh, than ever as a result of, uh, of um, uh, machine learning, because it turns out that um, a lot of the computations that we rely on in machine learning, these massive matrices and, and all the parallel multiplications and so on, they can be done with analog circuits uh, much more efficiently than using logic gates because you can just apply the laws of voltage and resistance um, and build analog components that when you flow the currents through will give you the computation results without having to go through logic gates. Um, and so there are companies working on analog computing chips that will allow you to do this sort of thing much more cheaply and much more um, efficiently uh, than our traditional high cost, high performance uh, chips. And again, there's an environmental angle to this because the analog chips will be so much more energy efficient and less costly uh, than the general purpose chips or the graphics cards that we have now doing this um and in the uh, in the inference stage of machine learning especially when you're not training the model but just applying the model um it's very likely that analog chips will all perform digital ones um and so you know we may all live in a future in which these analog machines um are kind of the dominant form of computing in our lives which will be really cool we hope to have ken join us at datafest event very soon Finally, on to the last question. Each episode, we pose our listeners a question and invite people from around the world to offer their thoughts. We'll read the most interesting ones out on a future episode. Our question this week is... Out of all the punk aesthetics, which one would you like to live in? So, for example, cyberpunk, dieselpunk, steampunk, raypunk, atompunk, or maybe you can make up your own punk. And that's it from us today. We'll be back next time with more insight, innovation, and wild speculation. Uh, feel free to drop us an email to say hello or to suggest a topic or make corrections. You can reach us at datafest at datalab.com or you can find us on Twitter at datafest underscore. And remember, if you like our podcast, please do leave us a review anywhere you listen to it. It really means a lot to us. Thanks for listening. Join us again next time for another episode of The Last Question. Go to Mars